Okay. I got to gather my thoughts. Pray to me a clean heart and restore unto me of my salvation. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes my spirit, my faith seems to grow a little stale. I don't know if anybody ever experiences that. And it's not as vibrant as it once was. And, um, and so maybe this morning, um, as we continue to worship, you'd allow me to pray for us. And let's pray um, that in this moment, the Lord will ret- restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Not so that we just feel good about ourselves, but so that we can clearly hear from Him today. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You this morning um, that You love us, that You desire to speak to us, that You are with us. We thank You that You have saved us uh, and made us Your children. And um, Lord, this morning, um, maybe we just need to take a brief moment to reflect on the day when that happened. Some of us can remember it. Others can't. But we all can I think at least remember a time in our life where you were big, (laughs) where um, you had changed us in some way and the joy that that brings, knowing that we did nothing to contribute to that process, but that you did it alone. And the gratitude that we experienced as we were freed uh, in that way. And Lord, we, we thank you for that today. And we, we pray just as you made that happen um, in the past, at, at that moment, uh, it was all you changing us. We pray now that it would be all you again, changing us this day. That Father, as you remind us of that time, as we get into your word, as we pray, as we sing, as we fellowship together, that Father, um, we would once again have that joy and be focused because of it on giving you the attention and honor that you deserve. So Lord, this time is yours to that end and we are yours to that end. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So uh, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter seven. Uh, We're going to look at a a text um, this morning that may be familiar to many of you, may not be, but it has three central characters. You're going to see them in it. And um, uh, I'll read it, and then we'll see what what the Lord has to say to us today. But it's uh, Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 36, verse 36, and read through verse 50. If you don't have a Bible, I believe it'll be on the screen uh, behind me here. Um, And uh, the setting is in the house of a Pharisee. So when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He, meaning Jesus, went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who he is, who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little 
loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, this is an amazing story. Um, And in it, we find kind of this this design principle, this gospel principle, this, this biblical truth that, and, and it's this, that we love like we've been forgiven. This is what Jesus was teaching in the passage. He even says it in verse 47. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little How much or how little of the forgiveness of Christ that we are experiencing at any given moment of our lives will directly result in the level of love that we show toward our Savior at that moment. Are we the Pharisee who experienced little love? Who experienced little forgiveness? Or are we the woman who experienced deep forgiveness? So we have these three central characters, right? We have this woman, we have the Pharisee, and we have Jesus. There are others for sure, but those are the three central characters in the story. Jesus is the central figure, obviously. And the reaction of the others to Jesus reveals the true beauty, nature, and disposition of the other two characters. What we find is that how they appear on the outside is not necessarily indicative of what is going on inside. And that, what is happening inside for them, is what Jesus is most concerned about. On the outside, the Pharisee looked perfect. His clothing was beautiful. His language was clean. His life appeared to be sinless. He was devout and holy. Everyone assumed that he and the rest of the Pharisees were just these shining examples of the lifestyle that pleases God. Now contrasting the Pharisee, you have this woman. And she's the type of person that you encourage your children to kind of stay away from, right? She, the, the Bible isn't descriptive of, of her behavior or the particular sins that she had committed, but it's clear that she had a reputation, right? She walks in the room and everyone knows who she is and knows what she has done. Regardless of their their station and life or age or career or status, they all know this woman. She's lived a sinful life. Some have conjectured that possibly she was a prostitute and maybe she was or maybe she wasn't. Maybe it was just the worst sin that they could think of at the time, uh, you know. And, and for us, it, it might be something different. For us today, it might be the equivalent of, of a drug dealer, an organized crime leader, a, a, a smuggler, a human trafficker. I, I, I don't know, but regardless of, of what it was, she was to, to them unsavory. She was socially unacceptable. And in the context of the religious elite, she was unwelcome. She didn't fit with this crowd. Last year, my in-laws were coming home from vacation and they pulled up into their house. They live in a gated community on a lake and they got through the gate and they went around the lake and got to their house and they went down their driveway and pulled in and something just didn't look right. Let me just, something was just off. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where maybe you've come home and I've had this experience. I've walked in and something just felt kind of out of place in our home. And Dottie had gone to TJ Maxx and shopping and bought a mirror and put it up on the wall. And it wasn't there before. And, you know, and I, but I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it right away. And this is what's happening for, for my in-laws. They, they pull into their driveway and something's just off. And so they begin to process it. And all of a sudden they realize their other car is gone, right? Just gone. And um, they start thinking to themselves, did we take it to the shop? No, we didn't take it to the shop. You know, did we let our, my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Bobby and Julia, borrow it? And they said, no, we didn't do that. And, and finally, they get to this point where they realize it's just been stolen. Their car and their, their comfortable, secure, gated community has 
been stolen. And it really shouldn't have surprised them or us too much because they always left their keys in the car, right? They never took them out. Like it was just sitting there saying, hey, please take me. It's okay. But so, but it was gone. And the point of it is this. When, when they returned, something didn't fit. And they knew it. And, and, and I imagine as out of place as it was for my in-laws to find that their car had been stolen, it was even more out of place for the Pharisee and his guests to see this woman at the party. She didn't fit. But for them, it didn't take a minute to figure out what didn't fit. They knew right away it was her. And it was even more out of place to see this woman, this sinful woman, posing up next to Jesus, crying on Him, drying His feet with her hair, and pouring perfume on Him. You have this contrast, right? Contrast in people. You have this broken, social outcast and morally corrupt sinner contrasted with this pious, ritually pure, socially acceptable, and apparently perfect Pharisee. You have these two contrasting people, but you also have their contrasting responses to Jesus. The Pharisee invited Jesus in, placed him at a table, and things seem to be going well, and this woman enters, and she begins doing her thing, and it, it makes the host, this proper, saintly Pharisee, uncomfortable when this woman starts to do this stuff to Jesus. And he thinks to himself, we are told in verse 39, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him. And what kind of woman she is. That she is this sinner. And, and, and basically saying, if he knew who she was, he wouldn't allow her to do that. Any self-respecting, holy person would never allow this to happen. Some of us have made comments like that. Or been in situations where others have, have breathed comments that were unkind about us. Sometimes we deserve the comments. Jesus did not. He was even more than a prophet. And, and we know it just from this story alone. Just from, from this instance in verse 39 alone. Because we're told that this man thinks this thought to himself, but he doesn't say it. Yet who knows what he's thinking? Jesus. He reacts negatively, judgmentally, critically of Jesus. Now contrast that with the woman's response to Jesus. She's overwhelmed with Jesus' beauty, grace, mercy, love, compassion, forgiveness, and His power. And so she comes boldly into this party where she knows that she isn't wanted or welcomed. And unashamedly comes to Jesus, possibly the guest of honor, and pours this perfume on Him. Which, which by the way, was worth like years worth of salary. And she cries on his feet and dries them with her hair and she treats him with honor, dignity, and respect. In other words, she treats him the opposite of how the Pharisee treated Jesus. And the reason I think we have these two contrasting um, responses to Jesus is because these two have had very different or contrasting experiences with Jesus. After all this happens, Jesus knowing what the Pharisee is, is thinking, remember He never says it, He turns to him and tells him this story. It's about two people who owe money, right? And the one's debt is like ten times greater than the other one's debt. I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking, like, what if two of us um, had the same mortgage company, and we were called into the, the, the office, we didn't know why, and we get into the office, and you owe, like, two years yet on your mortgage, right? And I owe, like, 28 more on mine. And we're called into the, into the office, and, and the mortgage lender is like, I don't know what's going on, I just got word of this for some reason, the mortgage company actually wants to forgive both of your debts. Two years and 28 years. And um, there's no strings attached. It's just done today. You're walking out of here. You have no more debt with us. 
And I'm thinking to myself, well, the person who has two years is going to be like, well, that's nice, but I have two years left. And you know how that works. Like you're, you're, you're paying on less of your debt at the beginning, right? And more of it at the end. So you actually have very little of the debt left when you have two years left. I mean, it's, it's like fractionally not equivalent. And then, you know, but me having 28 years left, know that I have pretty much the exact same amount of debt as when I started it two years ago, because I've only been paying on interest, right? And so you're like, ah, two years, that's nice. Thank you. I appreciate that, but it's not a big deal. And I'm like 28 years, that's a very big deal. And that's kind of what's happening here. It's like 10 times the amount. Like, and, and Jesus says to the Pharisee, well, you know, who do you think is, is going to be more grateful? Who, who's going to be more thankful? And, and, and to his credit, he says the one who owed more. And Jesus said exactly. The truth of it was, he wasn't just telling some random story, right? He was, he was illustrating what's going on between the Pharisee and, and this woman. And, and the truth of the matter was, the woman loved Jesus so much, not because her sins were bigger than the Pharisees. It, both of them had big sins. All of us are equally sinful. It, it's not that she was a worse person than him. That's not it. Like, all of us, me included, are equally horrible people. But it, it was because she experienced God's love and forgiveness in a way that the Pharisee hadn't. The more we receive God's love, the more we are willing to love Him. To, the more we are willing to lose for Him. The more we are willing to give to Him. The more reflexively we love Him. Not just with our feelings, but with, with our actions. And that's what's happening here. This woman should not have been there. And, and, and she should not have done what she did. It was, it, she was also already like socially corrupt. Like People already thought terrible things about her. But, but if she had any, any ounce of self-respect left, she wasn't going to walk in here and do this in front of all these people. But there was nothing else she could have done. Because she had an experience with Jesus that compelled her to do this. These two were reacting differently because each of them had experienced Jesus differently. To her, Jesus was now everything. And to him, Jesus was still something of a novelty. Pharisee, I don't know if you know this, most of you probably do, the Pharisees generally wanted, were out to get Jesus. They didn't, they didn't like him. They didn't want to believe in him or have a relationship with him. In fact, just before this, in chapter 7 of Luke, um, Jesus says this about the Pharisees. Starting in verse 30, he says, um, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. And Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this, this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They just... They didn't want to believe in him. They didn't want to love him. They, he, he could have done exactly what, what they wanted him to do, and then they would have flipped on him on the other side, is what, what, what is being said here by Jesus earlier in the chapter. They just did not like him. They rejected God, so they rejected Jesus. They were unwilling to believe. So we should not necessarily view their invite to Jesus, to this party, this Pharisee's invite, as, as a change in pattern. We can see from the Pharisees' response to Jesus' love for the woman that his heart was still hard. He judges Jesus. He doesn't understand because he hasn't personally experienced Jesus' love. I, I love this woman. For, that probably came out wrong. <laughs> I, I love this woman. I love the story of this woman for so many reasons, right? But um, one of them is 
because of how differently than the Pharisee she acted toward Jesus. She, she was serving Jesus. Because, and she was doing it because she had experienced Jesus' love and response. She, she acted toward Him like who? Think about this for a minute. Who, who was she acting like? This wasn't probably like her, her normal kind of way of acting. She had a reputation. So I'm pretty sure she didn't go around doing benevolent, nice things for other people in the town. So this probably wasn't normal her, like normal kind of lifestyle for her. So, so who was she acting like? Think about it. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 20 this. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to do what? To serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So who was she acting like when she was serving that day? She wasn't acting like herself. She was now acting like the one she was serving. She was acting like Jesus. And I love that. Her faith had allowed her to have an experience with Jesus and it had opened her heart and she now loves Jesus because He first loved her. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan is called the accuser. What does the Pharisee seem to do? Accuse. Criticize. This is exactly what Satan does. They're both acting like the one that they have aligned themselves with. So here, here's the thing. Most of us who have experienced the love of Christ after a significant period of time passes, um, and we've you know kind of been a disciple of Jesus for a moment, um, if we're to be honest, we begin to feel pressure to live like the Pharisee. To keep... Co- to keep clean, keep our distance from those who are unclean. And this requires us to limit our associations with people, to basically to people who are like us, who are safe, who haven't been tainted by the grit and grime of the world. You know the people I'm talking about. You know the mentality that I'm referring to. Honestly, I I get it. I mean, it's scary entering into relationship with people who have not just sordid pasts, but, but who are also living unsavory lives in the present. For me, there's lots of reasons why I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm uncomfortable in those situations. I mean, I think to myself, what do I even talk to them about? I don't, I don't understand their life. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know how to strike up a conversation. I'm bad enough striking up conversations with people who are like me. Some of you can relate to that. Like, let alone people who are, have such vastly different experiences than me. How do I relate to them? I'm also concerned about offending somebody. Like, what if I say something that would just hurt their feelings because I don't know their background? And on top of that, I'm afraid of how they might treat me. <laughs> or talk about me, or what they might think about me, or that they might even hurt me. Or sometimes, I'm concerned that their sin might rub off on me. Could I pick it up like I pick up a cold or COVID? Sometimes it's even worse. I'm I'm afraid of what others might think, like what y'all might think, if you see me with someone who's that different from me. If you happen to come into a coffee shop that I'm having coffee with someone at, and you see me hanging out with one of these unsavory, sinful people, what are you going to think about me in that situation? Will I be guilty by association? Will you begin to treat me like we treat them? Will, Will your perception of me fall? And unfortunately, what that ends up meaning, all of that ends up meaning is that we limit most of our significant social interaction to being with people like us. Which means that the only people we really engage are people who already have Jesus in their life. But here's the thing. We are called to be Christians. right? And in fact, we were first called Christians in this town called Antioch in Acts chapter 11. And, and that term meant something like little Christs or, or, or something like belonging to the party of Christ. 
So literally, when you were called a Christian, you were be called, being called a little Jesus, a little Christ. We aren't, so the, I guess my, my, my thought is, my question is like, why am I so often settling for being a little Pharisee? People aren't going to like us either way. That's the reality of it. So if, if we're doing this because people aren't going to like us, then we shouldn't act in such a way that they don't like us. I guess what I'm saying is we should act in such a way that they don't like us because we're acting like Christ, not because we're acting like the Pharisee. And what does that look like? Well, what Jesus seems to be teaching us in this context is that one facet, one of the many facets of what it means to, to, to be like this is not worrying about the perception of our purity and loving those who are impure and loving them up close and personally. The Pharisee would have loved them from a distance, right? He would, probably would have said that he, he cares for all people. He might have given money to a, a beggar from, from a distance, but he wasn't probably going to sit down with that beggar and have a conversation. And for sure, there's precedent for us giving to others who are doing the ministry that, that, that God calls the church to do. We, we, we see this throughout um, the Bible. We see this throughout church history. It's good. We should be giving money to missionaries and others who are doing the work of ministry. That's very important. But we have to be doing the work too. It's a both and, not an either or. We are called to love those who are different from us, engage in, and engage in acts and behaviors. Um, that, love those who engage in acts and behaviors that we don't, that we might consider objectionable, unholy, dirty, sinful. We are to personally extend mercy to those who have been merciless. We are to personally love all people because this is the pattern that our master, our rabbi, the leader of our party, the authority of our life has set. And if we, like this woman, have experienced his love, then there should be no other option than to live like she lived, which was loving like he loved being willing to sacrifice any shred of self-respect that she yet had in order to care for, to love, and to do what her master does. She loved him a lot because he had loved her, and so we must do the same in our day, in our age, in our places. We can only do this if we are continually reminded of the joy of our salvation. If we're continually rooted in our Savior. If we're, if we're continually aware of His love for us. This isn't a once and done thing. I think sometimes I have that mindset that I become a Christian and I have that joy and then that just kind of stays with me for the rest of my life and I will just automatically, reflexively, now instinctively begin to do the things I should do. And that's just not the case. Very quickly, our love begins to cool. And we must continue to stay uh, practicing the disciplines that stoke that love and that fire inside of us so that it does not cool so that we can continue to love as He loves. We are not Jesus. So we must remain in Him so that He can give us what we need to do what He has called us to do, to do what He does. And it's not rocket science, right? We talk about this stuff a lot. It's, it's not. It's reading our Bible. It's praying. It's having fellowship with one another. It's coming and worshiping together. It's it's, it's, it's all these, these basic things that aren't hard, but, but they're very easily neglected. But it can't be an option because if we start to neglect them, we become little Pharisees. 
And we sit around and we judge each other and we judge other people. And we say things just like this Pharisee said. We might not say it out loud because he, he, he didn't say it out loud, but we certainly think it in our minds. I would, why would John ever think to do something like that? Does he not know? Is he not smarter than that? Why is James hanging out with that person? Does he not know who they are? James is shaking his head like, what is he talking about? But we can't, we can't say that that's okay. And we can't just fall into that. We must, must live like our rabbi. We must live like this woman who was living like her rabbi. Which means not just loving Jesus. We must come here and do that. But we must also go out and love people like her. And I don't know what that looks like for you. For some of you, that's easy because you work with folks, you live with folks who are far from the Lord and living lifestyles that are obviously not in line with what God would want for, for them. And so they're just there. For others of us, it's not as easy. Maybe we work at home or, or maybe we work in an environment where most people are followers of Jesus. And, and so it's a little harder to find, but it doesn't mean that just because it's harder to find that, we, that God doesn't have somebody for us. And you don't have to have as many people in your life as I have in my life. We just have to be faithful to what God calls us to do, the people God calls us to serve and love. If we do that, we're successful. But we have to be doing it. We have to be little Christs, not little Pharisees. Let me pray for us. Father, we, um, we confess this morning that we... We, we love this story. We love this woman. We love that what she represents and how you changed her life. And we can relate to that because all of us were people like her. We were lost and we were broken and we were wandering and we were totally undeserving of your love and forgiveness. Yet you gave it to us just like you gave it to her. But Lord, we also confess that so often we forget your love for us and we begin to live like that Pharisee. And it's not something we want. It's just something that we seem to fall into so easily. But Lord, it happens. And, and we, we would humbly ask this morning that you might forgive us for that. That you might heal us of that. That you might, Father, somehow, some way through the power of your Spirit, awaken us to the ways we are living like that, Pharisee, and that you would humble us to the point where we could confess that, Lord, and um, that we could again, through that confession, receive your love for us as that woman did and start afresh anew and, and, and be once again overjoyed to the point where we're willing to cry on your feet and wipe your, your feet with our hair and, and, and pour expensive perfume on you. Give ex lavishly to you by the way that we give to others in our community, by giving ourselves away, Lord, so that you would be glorified first and foremost, but then also so that when people in our community, in our spheres of influence, who are much like this woman, would be able to experience your grace and your mercy and your love as we have through us. Please, Lord, um, soften our hearts today. Don't let us just go through the motions. Please remind us of our salvation and the joy that we have because of it so that we can leave this place invigorated and ready to serve you this week. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your patience with us. And thank you for desiring to use us for your plans and purposes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue to worship. If you want to stand, we're going to sing one more song as we close today. And um, as you do, we, we pray, we, we hope that you will love the Lord through your singing a great deal because you know how much he has loved you.